Good afternoon. It's James Schmeling, the President and CEO of the NDU Foundation. Welcome to our National Security Briefing Series with uh, Dr. Kailan Hunter and Jeanette Haney today. Both of them are experts in the Women, Peace, and Security Act and will be sharing a great deal of information. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Lidos, and our board member, Bill Bender, in particular, who is a senior executive at Lidos for the sponsorship and making this possible. We're looking forward to the conversation today. As a reminder, it will be recorded. All of your questions were submitted in advance or may be submitted in the question feature of the GoToWebinar software. And I will be taking a look at those questions as they come in and selecting questions for Dr. Hunter and Dr. Haney both. At this point, we will turn it over to the NDU president, Vice Admiral Fritz Rogi, for his opening remarks. Thank you again for joining us. Okay, well, thank you, James, uh, for the opportunity, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining today's webinar. Of course, I also want to thank the NDU Foundation for hosting today's national security discussion. Uh, the foundation is one of the most important partners of the National Defense University, uh, but of course, in reality, everyone listening today is one of our partners because of our shared interest in the security of our nation. Now, today we'll be discussing how that security is enhanced through the contributions of women. And at the strategic level, women's direct participation in peace negotiations, as an example, increases the sustainability and quality of peace. Uh, a recent study investigating dozens of agreements across 42 armed conflicts over the last 20 years, 30 years, uh, found that peace agreements with women signatories are associated with durable peace, because those agreements uh, have a higher number of provisions aimed at the political reform that's necessary to address the root causes. And at a more tactical level, from uh, my experience as a submarine officer, and uh, I confess as a recovering personnel policy and assignments officer, uh, the submarine force was among the last of the communities allowed to benefit from the service of women. And I can attest to how much more ready and capable we are now that we're not precluded from competing for the talent that is resident in the 50% of America's population that is female. And so I very much appreciate the opportunity to introduce and listen in on today's session with our two panelists, Dr. Hunter and Dr. Haney. So just one brief word about the importance of your National Defense University. Uh, national security is our mission. We educate rising professionals to become the senior leaders across military, government, and industry that our nation will depend upon tomorrow. We help them to become the critical thinkers, the joint war fighters, and strategic leaders to provide the U.S. and our allies with the intellectual overmatch required to prevail against the threats of today and tomorrow, and to be comfortable dealing with uncertainty and ambiguity in dynamic and disruptive change. And the lasting measure of our success is the peace and security enjoyed by the United States and our partners. In the words of former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan, education is, quite simply, peace building by another name. It is the most effective form of defense spending there is. So let me then suggest that if you would want the leaders of your national security enterprise, the key decision makers contributing to your peace and security, if you would want them to be well educated in how to do so, then you should not only be partners of NDU, but advocates. And I hope that uh, that will encourage you all to learn more about the Chairman's University, your national defense university. So without further ado, let me turn our program over to two Marine Corps officers, combat veterans, and the leadership behind the mission of the Athena Leadership Project, which seeks to elevate the stories of female veterans and conduct research into how gender diverse teams and leadership impact national security, Dr. Kyle Ann Hunter and Dr. Jeanette Heen. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I am Dr. Kyle Ann Hunter. I am a former Marine Corps Cobra pilot with multiple combat deployments, as well as a former member of the Office of Legislative Affairs for the House of Representatives for the Marine Corps. I am currently an assistant professor in the Military and Strategic Studies Department at the United States Air Force Academy, 
and the Managing Director of the Athena Leadership Project. We are incredibly excited to be here to talk to you today on the work that's based on our research as well as our own experience as women Marines serving in combat. And thank you, Kai, and uh, thank you all for letting us join you today and for being part of this program. My name is Jeanette Godry Haney, and I too am a Marine Corps Cobra pilot and combat veteran. Um, I am a soon to retire Marine Corps officer, so my retirement date's in the next few months. Um, and now I don't fly a Cobra, I fly a Honda Odyssey minivan. Um, but like Kai, I went back to school to understand my experiences in the context of the Marine Corps as a woman and uh, in the Marine Corps during a time of war. I am currently the executive director of the Athena Leadership Project, and I'm an adjunct professor at Tulane University as part of the Disaster Resilience Leadership Academy. So I'm really excited to talk to you all today, and thank you so much for your time. All right, and we should have some slides that are up. Here we go. Great. Okay, so thank you so much for being here today. We are here to talk to you about broadly what it means to look at security through a gendered lens, and particularly looking at the Women, Peace, and Security Act of 2017 and what it matters for the, the DOD. Next slide, please. So why do we really hope you're here? Nope, one more uh, prior. Yep, there we go, perfect, thank you so much. So why, why do we hope you're here? Everyone is here because, as Admiral Rogi noted, the mission is national security. But what does it mean to talk about security? When you think about it in your mind, what, what is security? And more importantly, what does the U.S. government think security is? And we say that because in order to understand what a gendered perspective on security is, we first need to actually think about security. And when we think about security and all of the benefits that women bring in a gendered perspective brings, we can think about it at the tactical level, at the, the boots on the ground level, being able to see operational situations in multiple ways. We can think about employing new technologies and how diversity of thought and perspective is important to actually bring those in. We can think about cultural competency. How are we engaging with the world's population? And more importantly, how are we engaging with, engaging with that 50% of the world's population that has been historically ex excluded from these decision-making processes? And finally, what does it mean to have women at the strategic leadership level? And where are we bringing a gendered perspective there? So to illustrate this point, um, I wanna tell you a very short story. In 2003, just after the United States invaded Iraq, Ambassador Swanee Hunt urged the U.S. military to search for more qualified Iraqi women to help set up and lead the new Iraqi government. The initial search had only yielded uh, a, a few, a handful of women while yielding hundreds of men. And in response, when she brought this concern up to the Pentagon, she got pushed back um, saying, Ambassador Hunt will address women's issues after we get the place secure. As the ambassador wrote afterwards, she was bothered by the brush off because she wondered what women's issues he meant. When he, when, or the Pentagon meant when they referred to the women's issues. He was talking about security. The Pentagon thought they were talking about security. Security encompasses far more than what we as a nation often consider it to be. And so we want today to think about security in a more holistic way and to consider security through a gender lens. A gender lens. We will get that momentarily into what that specifically means. But briefly, I wanna tell you our agenda, we're gonna talk a little bit about why women matter and why we are discussing women in the context of security. Then we're going to lead into the discussion of the Women, Peace and Security Act of 2017, discuss the implementation guidance and national security impacts, and then we will take some moderated questions from the audience. Now on to slide three. So to start, let's just take a step back and say, do we even need women to serve? Now, this is a question that unfortunately has come up far too often. And so if we just even take a step back and look at the raw numbers, even if the benefits of women to security wasn't an issue, which we know it is, and we're going to talk much more about why it is later, the pure recruiting pool that is available to the United States military right now necessitates that we reach the widest amount of the eligible population possible 
and uh, that meaning that we need to bring women in to it. So just from a pure numbers, we need to recruit women. We need them just to be able to have the force strength that we possibly need for the service. In addition, though, when we think about this, is that it's, it's talent management and not just getting women in initially, but recruiting and retaining them throughout their service. This diminished pool of available talent means that we need to not just get women in once to start, but actually keep them in and keep them in a broad diversity of the, the MOSs that are available. To really illustrate this, I think it's important to look at a country like Hungary, for example, that is on paper doing really well. You know, if you look at their reports to NATO, they're close to 30% women in their services. But when you start to dig deeper in, what you actually see is that women are all very junior enlisted and that they are primarily in administrative or in uh, cooking, you know, the, the cooking MOSs. This doesn't shore up a diverse force. And just again, pure numbers alone are showing we need, we need this. But these numbers also tell us something about our investment in technology that we're making right now. We know that women are going to have to make up a broader percentage of the, of the force. And so in order to do that, we also need to be thinking about who are we designing our new aircraft for? Who are we designing our new, our new vehicles for? Because if we're not taking women's bodies into account, we're not only going to not be able to fill out our force strength, but also potentially you know, lose out on retaining that talent. Next slide. So additionally, when we think about security, there are massive benefits to the whole of security from the inclusion of women and female perspectives at every step in the security process. So the benefits of, of including women and feminine perspectives don't just benefit women, they benefit everyone. So let's think about security first through a gendered lens. What does that mean? Well, it means first and foremost, as Kai said earlier, whose security is being considered in doctrine, in training, in conflict planning, in execution, and in conflict resolution. Does who is doing the security matter? And it does. Often discussions and consideration of security in the United States have focused on the physical security of the men fighting the wars. This is problematic because these men are not the only people impacted by security concerns. And often the drivers of conflict are multidimensional. So the security of everyone affected impacts conflict and the likelihood of conflict. Thinking about security through a gendered lens simply means that we need to include the perspectives of women, men, girls, and boys, centering their needs, their experiences, and their skills as we consider security. We need to consider how those unique perspectives that each brings both can shape and be shaped by conflict, war, and instability. Because in the security sphere, the status quo perspective is overwhelmingly masculine. When we focus on including a gendered lens, it most often means centering security around the perspective and experiences. So let's talk briefly about Women, Peace, and Security, or WPS, as we call it. What is WPS? First of all, let's talk about why women potentially bring different perspectives to the discussion and consideration of, of security. First of all, it's not about women biologically being more nurturing or naturally being more inclined to find peace and cooperation. It's about women as a group being socialized to a set of experiences around the world. And as a result of that socialization process, women often bring different perspectives from those experiences to the consideration of security and help us understand the full security picture. Second, I really want to emphasize security in women, peace and security instead of peace, because the words framing this matters. If we consider security operations versus war, there tends to be more support among American people for the, the former. There's also a forced, uh, false dichotomy between this and thinking about war versus peace as the absence of war, as opposed to how we just consider security writ large. When we use the term peace and we associate it solely with women, this essentializes women and um, simplifies and, and oversimplifies why we want female perspectives included. Using peace associated with women puts everything associated with women and with security into women's issues, a category that we then sub more subordinate to what we think of as real security. So that all of these phenomena where the involvement of women and more diverse perspectives contributes to improved outcomes, such as the ones you see in this slide, violence, corruption, disease, mortality, economic opportunity. 
These all become women's issues, including conflict planning and management and security. And this is incredibly troubling because we know there is this growing robust body of research that looks at all of these things you have here, corruption, disease, mortality rate, inequality, as drivers of conflict. These are things that are well proven to make situations more violent and even start wars. However, when we are in the planning or conduct of conflict management, we say they are women's issues, we lose the opportunity to actually stop conflict before it starts. And so we say these need to be just security issues. You know, as Ambassador Hunt noted, that these aren't women's things. These shouldn't be relegated to the sort of back burner after we're done shooting or putting bombs on target, but considered in how we plan war and in what the actual aftermath and end result needs to be. Next slide. So for the past 20 years, the U.S. has been involved in actually codifying steps for the Women, Peace and Security agenda, beginning with UN Resolution 1325, which was really historic for its time, and that it was a public recognition that women were impacted and had the ability to impact both conf how conflict is done and what happens in the aftermath. As you can see on this slide, there have been a series of both executive orders around this as well as national action plans that have been created to actually implement UN Resolution 1325. However, one of the key characteristics about these is that they have historically been outward facing, externally facing. The United States has for the past 20, well, basically the past 20 years, looked at WPS as something that has to happen over there. And this is something when we think about you know, empowering women in Iraq or Afghanistan, ensuring that loans made to emerging democracies actually include women. And not until this year have looked inward into what we need to do, especially with our security forces. And so as Kai said, it's been 20 years. These have been a lot of small steps that we have taken as a world and as a nation. Um, and have often considered it someone else's problem and something that we preach to others about. However, uh, and this is where we'd like to see slide six, please. We're gonna talk briefly about the DOD plan in particular. Um, and some of what we say about this plan can bleed over into the other three implementation plans from state AID and Department of Homeland Security. So if you look at the DOD implementation guide, there are three objectives. Defense objective one, two, and three. And if you read these, um, and you don't need to read them in full right now, I'm going to give a brief overview. But objective one for the Defense Department talks about how the diversity of the force actually can allow women's meaningful participation across the development, management, and employment of the force. Objectives two and three are outward facing, looking at partner nations, encouraging women and partner nations to meaningfully participate and serve in all ranks and all occupations and to ensure that partner nations, defense and security sectors ensure women and girls are safe and secure and that their human rights are protected, especially during conflict and crisis. So the first objective is, is inward facing. And we were really excited to see this because our work throughout the past decade has hit very hard on the point that until we recognize inside our own institutions and inside the US government, how women are potentially limited how they, um, how recruiting is impacted, how development, promotion, and retention, inclusion of female perspectives is impacted until people and leaders who are promoted really understand the value and the benefit of WPS. Any WPS efforts on the outside will be less effective um, and potentially doomed to fail. So I wanna talk specifically about number one, about objective one. There are a couple main benefits that we really want to talk about, about having women or why WPS and inward facing view of WPS within DOD is important. First of all, it helps us look at structural considerations, things structurally, policies and programs, career paths that limit the promotion, development and retention of women. I think off the top of my head, as a woman with three kids who has tried to make a dual career uh, work, I can tell you right off the bat, childcare, co-location, uh, career path, the very rigid idea of a career path to general officer um, ranks. These are all things that limit women. Sexual assault rates, we did an event last week through the Center for New American Security where we talked about why sexual assault in the military 
um, is a crisis and limits our effectiveness in WPS. Um, boards, how boards are staffed, oversight, and the emphasis on all kinds of leadership skills for the whole um, for the whole soldier or marine or sailor um, or airman. So we also want to consider the benef the barriers that uh, that affect recruiting and retention throughout the way. We also want to talk about integration, a focus on numbers versus effective integration. And Kai will cover this a little bit more here momentarily. Yeah, so as, as Jeanette was noting, there are a variety of reasons that integrating more women is actually absolutely essential. I'm going to get to those traps in a moment, but I want to talk about three things real quickly that tie this directive one, this inward facing directive, directly to military effectiveness. And the first is enhanced decision making. Study after study shows that gender integrated teams are more effective at making decisions. And if you look at the planning guidance from every single chief of every single service, one of the number one things that is noted is that the world is getting more complex. And with a more complex world, with a more complex threat environment, we are going to need the ability to make broader and more robust decisions. And so gender integration is an absolutely essential thing that we have to do that for that. The next is fewer discipline problems. If you're looking at both NJPs, non-judicial punishments, and court martials, male-only units average close to 90 per thousand of uh, individuals who are in there who have some sort of disciplinary action against them. This results in huge amounts of loss of training time, of dollars spent at this. Gender integrated units have only about a third of that with regards to disciplinary problems. And so this is something when we think about just effectiveness, how are people actually using their, you know, being able to use the people in their unit, gender integrated troops have more access to training time and dollars because they're spending less time on disciplinary problems. And finally, if you think back to this body of research around the drivers of conflict, engaging women in this enhanced decision making has the opportunity to stop conflicts before it starts. If we think about these things around equality and access to healthcare and access to food as part of the planning process, we now are actually be often able to stop kinetic conflict before it begins. And if we think about security, it's not just you know, not being at war, but actually being able to holistically live your life. And that's an important part. And so a few quick notes on, on traps before we jump into questions. There have been quite a few efforts at doing this over the past 20 years. And the number one trap that tends to fall is what we call the, the integration trap or the add women in stir trap where the focus, the end state, is on numbers, not on what women actually bring. And this becomes a problem because if you just say, okay, we need 10% women or 20% women or 30% women, whatever that number is, you're not actually gaining the benefit. You're just putting basically pegs in a hole. And you are either forcing women to conform to the structure that has been antithetical to women's environment. And Jeanette and I both have a lot of personal experience in thinking that we had to be one certain way and conform to a very certain way of thought in order to actually do anything. So that's that's the one side, the, the one trap that's there. Or what you do is you just get women in as the tokens and you don't actually allow them to promote or grow because your focus on, is on just getting numbers in. So to combat this, you really want to be focusing on the end state. What is it that women actually bring as the goal, not how many women are there? The next trap is the standards trap. As women have been integrated into the previously closed MOSs or military occupational specialties, there's been this focus on getting the standards right. Standards are important. You have to be able to do the job to get the job. But that singular focus has really distilled this conversation rather than one of added value down to physical performance. And it negates, again, this is negating and it is essentializing women in a different way. Because what you are saying is that a woman is only as good as how fast she runs or how much she can carry. Not saying, okay, here's the bar. Now let's talk about everything that's just not physical on top of that. And the gate, putting it down to the physical trap has allowed for the rumor mill to go 
crazy and something we're definitely happy to talk about during question and answers. And finally is what I call the inspiration trap in that the military has held up these one or two very successful women and saying, well, if she can do it, then anyone can do it. And you know, we don't do that with, with men. We don't say, okay, well, everyone's going to be a chesty puller or a general mattis that's, that's here. And if you're not that way, we don't expect you to be in the service. Yet that's how we treat women. That if they're not this absolutely exceptional you know, example, then they're not worthy of service. And so that, that also then ends up discouraging women from joining in the, in the first place. And so with that, I'd like to, we can go to the next slide and kick it over for questions. Thank you very much. I appreciated that overview. I think this is a really important topic. And I know that I learned a lot just in preparing for this webinar, including the history, but more important, looking at what it is that we need to be doing now. And I'm going to start and, and ask you to expand a little bit on one of the last pieces that you talked about at, with a question from our uh, registrants. How do you ensure that we are empowering those diverse voices and not simply checking the box? And I heard you say, well, let's focus on what the outcomes are, but how do we make sure that people are doing that and how do we put those things on the table with our senior leaders? So the very first thing I would say is what I was finishing up with is avoid focusing, actively counter the numbers mentality. It's a trap that's easy to fall into. And uh, Kai gave the example of Hungary earlier. We need to focus more on what people of different perspectives and backgrounds could be doing and what they are doing, not how many women are serving, for example. Um, but the entire point of WPS and ideally the act and all of the codification that you saw leading back 20 years to UNSCR 1325 is to reap the benefits of diverse voices. This is why we see Defense Objective 1 is so important in the strategic framework and implementation plan for the DOD, because without it, we won't be recruiting, developing, promoting, and retaining leaders who truly understand the value of diverse perspectives in national security. So the best way to empower those voices is to create a structure that actively seeks them and ensures that their value is known and that it, the inclusion of those voices is rewarded and integrated at every point in every field throughout training, doctrine, planning, personnel, policy, everything. It also means actively seeking where those perspectives are being neglected or outright silenced, uh, which starts with recruiting and personnel policies, but spans mentoring, training, readiness assessments, doctrine, planning, wargaming, everything. And it's really, it is really about moving past the mentality of, oh, we need to plug and play the, the add women and stir concept, um, which we are very, very intimately familiar with at this point. Um, and it starts from the bottom off, up, it starts in the middle ranks and it starts at the top and it's at the top ranks at all. It, it, overall, it's a complex problem requiring a multi-pronged effort. And I, I think to that, when we look at what those policies are, which become very important, is that there's been this mentality that, look, we just opened all these MOSs to women, we're done. Uh, rather than, but to get and retain, there needs to be now you know, deliberate structural change, whether that is things with parental care, you know, Jeanette mentioned all these, parental care, co-location policies, um, even dwell time policies, like how are we actually retaining boards and saying you can stay in the same geographic area for 10 years of career? Do you really need to bounce back and forth across the country every two years? Because we know these things are what end up driving women in particular out. And it's, it's, there's often this thought that like, oh, well, should the military just be changing the way women are socialized in society? I mean, that's, the way women are socialized in society is a whole other can of worms really to look into. But what the military does have the opportunity to do is to address that reality and make, you know, make structural changes that ensure that that differential in socialization isn't a hindrance to women's ability to be in the rooms they need to be in to affect change. So I think that there was a piece that you alluded to earlier in terms of the force recruitment and the ability to attract women into military service. And one of the data charts that I saw indicated that there is actually a huge gap in who thinks about whether or not to join the military. Do you think that the ability to demonstrate the impact that women are having at senior levels, whether that is policy or in the military, or in the broader uh, national security and, and State Department sense will make a difference? And, and how do we ensure that those things 
are made uh, available in terms of knowledge to women who are still choosing what they're going to do? Well, I, I think it actually has to start lower than that. I think that women who are considering to joining, whether it's the military, the State Department, any of, of these security forces, aren't yet thinking about being at the senior level. They're thinking about what the next five years of their life is going to be like. And Jeanette mentioned the panel we did with Center for New American Security on sexual assault last week. And I think one of the first things we need to do is fundamentally change the way that we value women's service with regards to sexual assault and harassment. Because if women don't feel that these security forces are taking that seriously and they're not going to be safe, they're not gonna choose that career. So I think they need it before we even get to the aspirational side of you can have this great impact, we need to start with, we're an institution that's gonna keep you safe. And I think to add to that, um, at the same time, we need to press at the middle and high ranks. Um, because if we have general officers who understand, who look like the people that we're trying to recruit and have experienced some of the same experiences that people we are trying to recruit might have experienced, then when they're sitting around a conference table talking about recruiting, about retention, about why Marines, for example, leave the Marine Corps or stay in, then the perspectives of the women that we are trying to recruit will potentially be included. And without those voices, when you walk into it, you know, when you walk into a room and the only people representative are some were from one demographic, uh, then that decisions and the perspectives that come out of that will necessarily be somewhat limited. So it is important to attack on both sides. But the sexual assault piece in particular, when we spoke about it last week, and I'm glad, I'm glad Kai brought that up, um, I know that is that is something right now that we are both very concerned about, um, having seen some of the responses from different communities around the United States to what happened to Specialist Vanessa Guillen and to the stories that keep coming out. Um, I, you know, I've got three kids. I wonder right now if, if one of mine tells me she'll want to join the Marine Corps or go to the Naval Academy, my answer right now would be uh, to, to encourage her to, to go somewhere else because I'm concerned, I would be concerned about her livelihood and her welfare. And on top of that, how much her perspective would be valued as she went up the ranks. I think that's a hugely important issue, and I, I would advise folks to take a look at the archive of your um, presentation over at CNAS. I think that was excellent. I want to divert a little bit for a moment and talk about what it is a difference that, that it makes to have women represented, whether it is here in the U.S. in the military and DOD or whether it's overseas, and, and go to a question from one of our audience members. Um, female presidents, uh, and specifically in New Zealand, Taiwan, Denmark, and Germany, excelled in their COVID responses. Do you see the same here where we are having forces that are led or public health responses or governors that are women responding more um, robustly to things like COVID? And, and how is that an illustration of where we need women in those leadership roles to make those decisions be better decisions? I think that this is a very interesting question. And actually we're, we're building a research project right now to look on this within the United States to look at how diverse leaders at the, the city and state level have impacted the, the crisis, the decisions they've made, how they've communicated those decisions and how those decisions have impacted the population and been accepted by their citizens. Um, it is a very important question um, because understanding the mechanisms at place can help us at play can help us better understand teach and employ WPS. But I have a couple words of caution uh, and Kai and I have spoken about this a number of times. Um, one is we, if we're going to study this question, we have to do it to better understand the mechanisms at work. If we're just looking at correlation, then we're not going to learn very much, and it risks essentializing women. And by essentializing women, I mean what I was talking about earlier with a a view of women as equivalent to peace, right? So that all the decisions women make, they're better leaders because they're nurturing or more maternal or uh, cooperative. These may be true in different individual ways, but we need to understand how and why. So in the context of studying female presidents and female leaders, the, the big question is why and how are they leading differently and what those impacts are? And I think the the other piece to, to look at that Jeanette and I have talked a lot about is that COVID represents a very discrete temporal thing. It's it's a you know, we know what it what it is. There is it really is, yes, it has taken a whole of government response. And I think if you look at New Zealand in particular, they took a a very whole of government response to this, which is important. 
However, it was one threat that was being done. And it's, it's really to go back to Je Jeanette's point about looking at the mechanisms is the fact that military operations are by design created to be in complex multi-threat environments. And so the hope is that if we can take learnings from here's one threat that we can really narrow in on the, on the mechanisms, we can then look at what is, what is or isn't applicable to a broader multi-pronged approach to be able to again pull those characteristics out. Because, you know, ideally, we'll have men doing these things, too. Like, that's that's also the benefit of, of actually studying the mechanisms, is it's things that good leaders should be doing. In this case, we have a handful of good leaders who happen to be women. So let's look at what actually made them good leaders. Let's look at what those things are that men historically have lacked and say, you know, are these things that we can fully embrace throughout or, or and look for in our leaders regardless of gender? And it's, to add one more thing onto it, um, it is a very complex phenomenon. So if you're looking at leadership, for example, in COVID, are these leaders le leading differently? Are they in power in part because the governance structures that allowed them to, to run for office or participate in politics in the way they did, are those simply more effective? And that's why they have more diverse leaders in place? Or are communication methods different? Or do women actually, who, who attain, you know, who reach those levels of office, actually have experiences that have taught them to lead differently, more empathically, more co uh, cooperatively, um, and to include different perspectives in their own analysis? So that's really why part of understanding what's going on there and understanding those mechanisms is so important. So then to carry that over here in the U.S., one of the things that we need to do is really understand how and why women are leading in national security roles and look at, at all of those things holistically through research and through actually seeing what's happening and, and what's being done and why and how. How are we able to study that now? What, what studies are in place? What do we need to know about this? Well, I think this is this is a, a, a tough one, and this is really the, why we created Athena, I think, <laughs> is to the fact that historically there was a, you know, after the, the adoption of UN Resolution 1325, one of the, the positive benefits is that there started to be a, you know, the impact that women have on all sorts of political and conflict questions was beginning to take seriously. Um, that 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 there were some great studies that that came out um, there. However, the vast majority of studies that we have are still quantitative in nature, where they are able to statistically show that yes, either having more women is beneficial, or the implementation of certain laws that reduce gender inequality is beneficial. But that how mechanism is still missing, and that's that's really our big crux at Athena is looking at. What is the, the how? Where is the qualitative? We have the quantitative numbers to show that this, this is happening. This is a phenomenon that exists. And the uh, slide four, I believe it was in our presentation, shows these are positive effects that are statistically significant and negative effects that are statistically significant. And so to get into those mechanics of why is still something that there's a, there's a dearth of research on that we're we're digging into both with, you know, that Jeanette alluded to around COVID response, but also, you know, mechanisms around sexual assault, as we had noted. Why, why does that particular, like, we know it's bad, quote unquote, but what, what aspects of how sexual assault is responded to are actually driving and discouraging women? And it's really what makes this such a, um, go ahead. I, I was just going to ask, so given those things, how do we teach this? How do we make sure that in our national security education and specifically senior PME, how do we make sure that these perspectives are there and that we consider them and that we encourage the further research that's necessary? That's a great question. And uh, Kai is actually teaching it right now uh, to <laughs> cadets. Um, so it is, um, first of all, it can't be a one-off having an elective somewhere or having the one day where we talk about women or women peace and security um, in a curriculum is is not enough. It needs to be integrated in every step of the way, uh, at every step of the way throughout different courses. Um, and it really needs to be it needs to be part of our doctrine. It needs to be part of our training and war gaming. Uh, it needs to be baked into the process. And so part of it is you you need to develop that curiosity in people, in students, um, in service members, in people working in national security. And I a quick story um, when I first started studying 
gender and security, it was during my master's program and I was due for my youngest and I needed to find in my international relations course a very quick topic to do a research paper on because I was due at the end of October and I needed the paper done first. And as a Cobra pilot, I had not really flown with other women. And so every time I flew with someone new, um, he said, and it was a, always a he, he said, oh, I've never flown with a woman before. And I would say, neither have I, are we different? Like, please tell me. And uh, so as a joke, I did my first research project for that master's class on the, um, the correlation between female leaders around the country, around the world and interstate conflict rates. And lo and behold, there was a correlation and that made me very curious. So when I, um, when I started studying, it was from that perspective. So we need to introduce that curiosity. Why? Why is there a difference? And how can we harness that difference? Because as the United States, one of our, our biggest strategic strength is probably the diversity of our people. So how do we harness that? Because we're going to need it. Yeah, and I, I would just add to really foot stomp this idea that it can't be a one-off. It can't be a small elective. It really, it has to be just security. When you're looking at security, it's if you're, if, if anyone on this is, is designing a course right now, Ask yourself three questions about the authors that you are putting on to have your students read. Uh, who are they? And not just, you know, what's their their gender or their background, but you know, where were they educated? Who are their mentors? Who are they, who are they talking to really? Where because we can get very insular in this the same body of scholars. What questions are they asking about security? And if you have, you know, if your entire syllabus is full of people asking the same question of like, what led to World War II to start? Or how do we deter nuclear weapons? Whatever it is, like if you're asking that same question, maybe you need some diversity in questions. And then finally, what cases are they using for evidence? You know, if we're using the same cases over and over and over again, are we really getting diversity of thought in here? Do you have cases that are looking at civil wars in Africa and the counterinsurgencies in Latin America when you're when you're looking at this or is everything right now a study of ISIS you know that that that's that when you naturally ask yourself those three questions and it's something I've challenged all, all of my colleagues to do it's amazing well it shouldn't be amazing but you naturally start to bring what we what we have like pigeonholed as WPS into your curricula just by saying, I need to make sure I'm looking at, even if it's something like, I need to look at three major conflicts in this, not just not just one. Or I need authors, I want an author from a East Coast institution, a West Coast institution, and an international institution. You'll bring that, you'll bring that in because I think we, especially in the PME world, get so used to reading the same things over and over again. And it puts more work on you as the instructor, but that's also your job. So that's what we're, we're here for. And that then, if you introduce that diversity, I've also found you breed diversity in your students, you know, and you, or curiosity. You, that's what, if you introduce that diversity, you breed curiosity in your students because they will find something that they resonate that they don't see in what we think of as like these traditional syllabi that we see. And that's, that's what we want. We want, you know, we want leaders like PME is about not just checking a box, but developing leaders who are going to think more critically about the conflicts that we have. That's a really interesting perspective. And I, and I think that's um, something that we definitely need to, to think about. And particularly maybe right now, while we are shifting our focus to great power competition. And a lot of what we've looked at with women in the military and the US military in particular has focused on stability operations and women in the military who are spending their time talking to women who are on the ground in whatever country they're in, as opposed to thinking about the strategic um, leadership that's necessary there. What, what do you think that women and this approach brings to great power competition as we are really thinking about those range of threats? So, uh, first of all, I wanna say, if you haven't read anything by Carol Cohn, I would love to send out a couple of things for people to read. Um, she did a great uh, chapter back in the mid nineties on strategic dialogue between Saddam Hussein and President George H.W. Bush in the build up to the first, uh, to the Persian Gulf War. And, uh, and the way she described that as far as how gender dialogue and different perspectives shaped the moments that led up into the, the invasion and the aftermath, was very good. She also put out a New York Times article last fall, or in 2017 actually, on dialogue with North Korea. Um, so 
let me get back up for a second and give you a, a short story. Um, I was at the National Security Council last fall for a meeting and ran into a gentleman who was retired from the military, 30-year um, career, who was serving in a civilian position in the NSC. And I was there to talk about research on gender and terrorism. And after the event ended, um, he wanted to talk for a few minutes. Uh, and he wanted to know what, if I could give him one example of when a woman bested a man in hand-to-hand -hand combat on the battlefield. And if I couldn't, then he called my research a word that I'm not going to repeat on the air. And, uh, and so my question for him was, first, it was not a very imaginative response, um, having heard a lot of imaginative responses over the years. But the second, is that the only moment that matters in thinking about conflict and security, that moment of hand-to-hand -hand combat on the battlefield? Absolutely not, right? And, and I'm preaching to the choir here. It starts all the way back at rhetoric and shaping and how we understand other nations and goes all the way through that moment, through conflict resolution, peace processes. So we, when we consider, for example, the threat from Russia and China, understanding the complex cultural clashes that are going on there and how we communicate, understanding their perspectives and how they view us, especially in the age of disinformation, uh, as we're looking at the fall election and some of the news that articles that are coming out about that and how COVID is being used as a security um, as a security topic, as a, as a way of potentially getting an advantage over the United States. There are all kinds of ways that gender and gender perspectives can impact national security across that entire range. So limiting it just to a woman searching women at the marketplace or just to a woman and man facing each other in hand-to-hand -hand combat on a battlefield is uh, probably about one and a half percent of what WPS actually is. So looking at this again at, at great power competition, uh, right now as we look at the allies that we have in certain places, their leaders are women. And in the states where we are competing, um, with the potential exception of North Korea right now, which is a little unclear as to some of the leadership of uh, uh, of the sister um, whose name has just escaped me. I apologize, but at, at uh, the sister of the of Kim Jong Un, and and other than that, do you think that there's a difference here that we need to understand those sorts of perspectives on how our allies look at us and how we look at our allies who are led by women and and vice versa? And is there something there in the great power competition aspect of it and how we bring in diversity of thought in in this process as well? Yeah, and, and again, I will echo Jeanette here and say, if you haven't read anything by Carol Cohen, this is a, a perfect, you know, because this, this dialogue, and, dialogue and rhetoric is so important. But I think one of the things when we look at some of our allied nations that have women leaders, you know, whether it's, it's Germany or, you know, recently Sweden actually just came out and said they created a feminist foreign policy that's, that's there, is that it's important to look that this isn't just a figurehead position. You know, often when you see women in, in powerful positions, and this really is why this inspiration trap is a, is a problem, is that historically it's been like, oh, look, we've got our, our token shining woman. We've solved gender inequality. If one of the things that's most important to look at at a lot of our NATO allies, and they've been doing this work for a long time, is that the, the idea of a feminist foreign policy doesn't mean, oh, we hate men. Like that seems to be, you know, this this shorthand often they're like, oh, we don't want men involved. No, it means that every decision is made with an eye to how is this going to impact women at home and impact women abroad. And it's done up and down the decision making process from the lowest thing to how roads are being paved up to who you decide to ally with and if you choose to intervene in a, in a conflict. And so I think for us, what's really important when we're looking at this engagement is, you know, we're not making these decisions even at the most lowest level to look at how things might impact women. I mean, even to just think about, we talk about COVID here that we've been talking about before, these conversations around schools opening or, or not opening, nobody has really in the policy discussions other than a few women members of Congress, of course, brought up the fact of how having kids at home has disproportionately impacted women in their employment um, possibilities. So having these, these conversations at every single level of decision making is essential, I think, for us to 
keep up with our allies as we're looking towards recovery. Because when we, when we look at recovery from COVID, we look at what some of the security threats might be, we're going to need to start thinking about how are we going to, to actually be addressing this new normal. And part of it is looking at how are we addressing this dual hat of women who need to both mother and, and work. And I know that went off tangent a, a little bit, but to, to really think that when we think about our allies with women leaders, it's not just that they have a woman as a figurehead so they're perceived differently, which is definitely something that again, Carol Cohen is, is great on that, is that it allows for a fundamental change in how decisions at the lowest level to the highest level are made and who's being included. And I think that the difference is having spent some time in NATO, they see a lot of our decision making as intentionally excluding at least half of the population. And that's where they see as one of our biggest weaknesses. And there's a big economic component to this, as Kai was discussing just now with the discussion about COVID and its aftermath. Um, but as we think of the United States, you know, we think of ourselves as global moral leaders. And if we are unable to represent and consider the perspectives of half of our population, then we, we lack credibility on the international stage, especially as our allies are moving further and further in that, in that direction. And where we lack credibility, we create space and we create space for our adversaries to move in and build that credibility for themselves. That was one of the reasons that I was interested in the perspective of where we actually have women leadership in some of our allies that maybe differs from our own in terms of how are we planning and how are we coordinating and how are we as allies able to work and leverage that experience and so on. I'm going to shift a little bit because we have a very diverse population at NDU, as you know, and, and a large part of our student body are Department of State folks and from other executive agencies as well as uh, international leaders who are coming from uh, about 130 different uh, folks from about 60 or 70 different countries in any given year. Um, how do you see the implementation differences between DOD broadly and between those other actors as being important to this work? Um, Don Steinberg, Ambassador Don Steinberg had a great article out the, on this uh, that came out a couple weeks ago and happy to send it to you after in case any of the um, panel attendees are interested. But you know, we feel like all steps are good. Um, that said, we don't feel like there's enough in any of the plans. And we, we're particularly concerned with DODs because as Marines, this is where our, our major interests lie. But we feel that all of the plans lack a very obvious link towards where the funding and resources will be spent, where the priorities are. Um, there are inward facing metrics for most of those. I, I found um, the Department of Homeland Security is to be particularly short in that area. And uh, DHS also seemed to have to step back a bit from its 2016 commitments uh, to humanitarian immigration for women and girls as well. But there are a lot of words that were used like that, you know, encourage, support, enable, empower, but without a clear mandate and specific steps being offered to do exactly what we were saying, what, two or three questions earlier about how to actually increase the diversity within the forces or within the institutions. If we are not developing, promoting, retaining, recruiting, and drawing in and then integrating the perspectives of a diverse group of leaders in every agency, then no matter what we do on the outside in coordination with partner nations, um, we will still be less effective. And it risks the WPS agenda in, in, you know, in its entirety as a result. Um, we've also seen things, you know, man, we've both been part of a number of mandatory trainings and gender-focused meetings, particularly within the context of the Marine Corps and the military, that fail to, to generate any traction or to get buy-in from the leadership because it's simply seen as an ad women and stir kind of piece. And so a lot of the metrics identified in the implementation plans seem to be tied to hard numbers. How many meetings a year? How many, how many women are consulted? How many consultant groups are brought in? Um, that is not enough. We would like to see a, a we would like to see an inward facing component that's very robust for each and then funding and resources tied to each uh, with reportable metrics on the outside. And I think one of the other things that's really important that I think is, you know, as Jeanette noted, there's a lot of this encouraged support. There's really no direct communication link between the agencies around this. You know, this is just like this shouldn't be something that is stovepiped as a little pet project in our, our PMEs. 
without a, a clear cross-departmental measure of, of something. You know, I think this is almost anti like antithetical to how, you know, climate change is being addressed, where there are clear communication metrics across departments to say, you know, here's, here's where the agencies work together. Here's where one has like the bigger chunk than the other one. There's none of that. These are very, very siloed plans, if we want to call them plans, or, you know, I would call them more, you know, positive position statements on something than even like dig in plans, but they, they aren't talking to each other very well. And, and it's going to, I think our biggest fear is that that's going to encourage this to be sort of set aside as somebody's collateral duty of like, oh, here you go. Here's a, uh, you get to go be the WPS person for a day or two. And then it gets sloughed off on, on somebody else because there aren't actual metrics that also hold accountability among each other. Thank you. Um, I'm going to answer a quick question uh, with a request from you. Um, we, they're asking which books or articles would you recommend? And so I'm going to say very clearly, we're going to ask you to follow up with yep. us. We will send that out to all of the people who participated. We really appreciate it. We'll also post that recommendation list on the website archive so that people can hear that. Um, there's a, another question here that that I think is is interesting. And the, the focus here, is, to me is, is an interesting aspect. I wonder if this framework is how to include a more diverse set of opinions and points of view, and would this also benefit men? Is this a problem only for women, or is it simply a problem that's been surfaced as a result of women being included? Um, I suspect that the inclusion of women certainly uh, has something to do with why this has been surfaced as a problem, but the benefits of this and the outcomes are what you've really been talking about, and, and I think that's really, really critical. Um, so can you talk just a little bit more for a minute about the benefits that you see of implementation of WPS? Um, we've got about four minutes left, and I'd, I'd love to finish out with uh, why we should do this in a positive way and how it makes a difference for all of our communities. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, this is this is something that isn't. I think one of the the things is that these things that are pigeonholed as women's issues. So let's again review some of them: healthcare, income equality, access to education, access to food and water. These are things that every single human being benefits from. And so when we talk about this agenda, when we talk about this being part of security. This really is security for, for everyone. And you know, I think if you look at the flip side, when we take a less holistic view of security that excludes women and we see more war and conflict, more men end up dying. And so if we think about just the benefit, let's, let's look at a benefit where we have all of society being able to live healthier and, and more robust lives. And I think on that one, I will include another article that uh, Charlie Carpenter wrote around how excluding women from the conversation actually led to the massacre of um, men in Bosnia during um, some of the air bombs for thinking of like whose life is valued more than more than others. And so there's another piece to include in this. And the only thing I'd add very quickly is that. Uh, two short points. One is that the more we define women in relation to men as someone's daughter or sister or wife, et cetera, the more we devalue their experiences as a person. Um, and we rise by lifting all. So having more diverse viewpoints makes us all better. If I think about how much more informed and, and aware I am by reading books and articles written by people with vastly different experiences from my own, um, I mean, that's the answer right there. Thank you very much. We're uh, at the end of our time, but I want to thank you for the perspectives that you've offered and for your willingness to follow up afterwards with some recommendations for folks to further immerse themselves in this dialogue. I think this is a really important topic, and, and I'm really thrilled to have had you here today. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Thank you, Dr. Haney. Um, we appreciate you and your contribution to NDU. Thank you thank so you. much thank for having so us. And with that, Ashley, we'll take a look very quickly at what our next upcoming webinar is and share a little bit of information on that. 
We'll have Tara Murphy Doherty, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Govini, and the Honorable Robert Work, who's the Chairman of the Board of Govini, among other things. And many of you know uh, Chairman Work. I've had some great conversations with them, looking at supply chain issues, understanding what our supply chains look like, the diversity of those, and the minimization really of the DOD supply chain and the number of companies that are in the defense industrial base now. There's a lot here. Their reports with uh, others have been really fantastic. NDIA is a good partner of theirs, and I look forward to hosting all of you for that one coming up on September 1st. Again, thank you, everybody. Thank you to our sponsor, Lidos, and have a wonderful afternoon.